So this morning, I'm uh, going to talk about the uh, third ox herding picture, which is called um, seeing the ox or catching sight of the ox. And uh, here's a uh, picture from the wall in the other room. Let's see if I can put it up here without too much reflection there. And uh, you can just see the rump of the ox uh, behind a tree. So it's not a, a clear view, but you know, there's something, something there, something big, actually. <laughs> um, so what this represents is just the first inkling that I might not be a, my ideas or my images of who I am might not be as solid as I think they are. You know, you saw the last week, uh, the herdsman saw the, the traces, you know, the, the, the tracks in the path and begin to think that, you know, maybe there is something uh, to this Zen after all. And here, there's some kind of an experience, you know, it's like, uh, I won't call it a, a full Kensho or awakening experience, that would be the next stage, which is actually seeing the whole ox, you know, and um, Maizumi Roshi told me when you see the ox, clearly, I should be able to tell him how many hairs it has on its chin, you know. <laughs> but here you're just kind of getting a glimpse of uh, of the ox, you know. Like uh, I I wrote in my uh, Zen autobiography, one of the the first long, really long session that I went to, um, seven day retreat. Um, I had vowed that I wouldn't fidget all the other sessions I went to. I was a pretty adept at fidgeting. And um, just a minute, there's somebody waiting to come in whose name I recognize. Okay. Um, so I, I sat still, even though it was uncomfortable and at times excruciatingly uncomfortable. But there was a moment during this retreat when suddenly all of the pain that I was feeling in my knees and my hips and my back would just disappear. It just felt light and airy, you know, like I was almost like floating. And there was an awareness there, but uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't me that was aware just an awareness of it and uh, and I felt you know like I was just the space itself you know and like uh, as as light as the breeze which was uh, wafting through the, the trees around the property where I was you know you know I was in space and I was like this as free as the stars, and I was a star. So that's kind of like an experience of of seeing the the possibilities, you know. That so much of our sense of who we are is very subjective, just tied into our uh, our views, and. Uh, these views can change. But of course, then I tried to hold on to that state and it, it didn't persist, you know, go in and out of it for this whole week. So there's a verse that, that goes with this. Uh, it says, if you attain by way of sounds, you will encounter the source of all seeing. The six sense organs are each no different from this. In all actions, the head is revealed. It's like the salty taste of water 
the binder in the paint. Raise your eyebrows and there is nothing other than that itself. So it's saying that uh, when you open your eyes <coughs> and take a look, you see nothing but yourself, everything. And this expression, you know, that it's like the salty taste of the water, you know, and, you know, just looking at the ocean, you don't know whether it's salt or, or <clears throat> whether it's uh, clear water, um, fresh water. And uh, how do you describe it to somebody who hasn't tasted it, you know? somebody who's lived their whole life in the mountains where there's only freshwater streams and lakes would know the experience of submerging in the ocean with its salt or even a place like the Great Salt Lake <laughs> where there's so much salt that you're you're buoyant even people who sink in freshwater are, are buoyant yeah and uh, and the taste of being in, in salt water, how do you describe it to somebody who's never tasted it? So that's what to sing, you have to kind of see it yourself. And um, in the second stage, you know, the, the student understood um, the fundamental laws and beings intellectually. But in the third stage here, she goes further into the real origin of beings and uh, sees more clearly. So getting a, you get a glimpse of the ox, but you're not quite sure what you saw. And by continual practice, this ghostly figure becomes clear. And um, you we chanted the Heart Sutra this morning. <clears throat> so this could be the experience of no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. So the the intellectual training that we had in the experiential start to come together here. So it's leading us back to the original nature of one's true self. So there's a story of a master named Panchan, and one day the monk Panchan went into the town, and by chance he saw a man in the butcher shop who wanted to buy some meat. And uh, the customer said, please, um, cut me off a piece of good meat. Whereupon the butcher threw down his knife and crossed his arms and retorted, in my shop, there's only good meat, not a scrap of bad. And on hearing this, Panchan was awakened. You know, it reminded me of the quote of Uman where he says, every day is a good day. And uh, Maizumi Roshi, whenever he talked about that, used to always interject. He said, even having difficulties, every day is a good day. Why is that? It all depends upon our attitude, you know, how we see things. Yeah. Now, we can take some difficult things. You know, there was this uh, story I read about this man who was complaining about all of the horrible things that had been happening. You know, he had uh, his uh, gallbladder had been bothering him and he had surgery and took him a while to recover and his mother had died and uh, he was forced into retirement from a job that he enjoyed. And then uh, his son was uh, going to take some uh, 
entrance exams from college, but had an automobile accident, totaled the car, and the, the son was kind of tight, was uh, in the hospital for a little bit to recover. And he was just moping around, just talking about how horrible things were, and his wife saw him moping around, and she reflected on it for a while, and then she said, well, I, th I, I think we're blessed. I mean, you finally got rid of that gallbladder that had been bothering you so much. And uh, your mother had a peaceful death, is no longer suffering. And uh, you're no longer tied to that job. And now you're free to do what you really want to do, you know, which is write your novel that you've been thinking about for a long time. And bless, we were blessed because our son wasn't seriously injured, you know, in that automobile accident, and he'll be able to take his exams and go to college, and, and the car can be replaced, you know. So she flipped him around from looking at everything as negative and saying that there's a positive side to it. I think we have that, that expression, every cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> and I'm sure there's lots of other aphorisms like that, you know. When life hands you lemons, make lemonade or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> right? But sure, I mean, all kinds of horrible things happening. I mean, we know around the world there's horrible things, horrible wars, many thousands of people exterminated. How can that be a good day? You know? And how is it that all meat is good meat or everything is, is good? Well, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, they talk about the basic goodness of each person. But that goodness and this good here and every day is a good day, it's not good as opposed to bad. It means it includes good and bad. It just is. But when we see horrible things, then what's our responsibility? <coughs> You know, Ro Roshi Shinko's um, going to lead a program next week at, for the Zen peacemakers uh, chanting the mantra and visualizing the, the tar of great peace to help bring some positive energy into these negative situations and we can at least do something to spread healing energy. So in this, in this stage, we begin to see that everything is empty, but it doesn't mean that uh, that we don't aren't don't have the discerning wisdom, you know, in the. Um, I think trust and heart mind that say the way is perfect for those who do not pick and choose. But I prefer to say for those who are not attached to their preferences. And we pick and choose all the time what we're going to do. But it depends on how attached we get to them. So catching sight of the ox is a stage of having seen clearly the real self. But what does that mean? So up to this point, you've been thinking that there's a, a substance or the ego, which was called the self. But to see the real self clearly is to experience the fact that actually the self 
is completely devoid of substance and that the ego was never really there. It's not, as I said, this stage is not a thorough letting go of the ego, it's just getting a glimpse. <laughs> So for many, um, there's many stories about Zen masters who experience as initiated through some kind of a, a resonating sound or a, something that they see. So uh, Master Mumon, who's the author of The Gateless Gate, attained uh, an awakening when he heard the boom of a big drum in the monastery. And Master Kyogen, was raking in the garden very earnestly when a stone which lodged in his broom flew off and struck the bamboo and that sound awakened him and ryu you saw the peach blossoms following so which were their glimpse of the ox could happen by anything, but what precedes that is what's important. I mean, Kyogen sat for many years with Isan and and kept asking Isan to tell him what it is. And Isan said, "If I told you, it would be my words, not yours." And he sent him off, and and he was tending the garden or the tomb of the national teacher raking it just in that question of who am I never went very far from his mind constantly focused on it so whatever you see or hear in every individual thing is no other than yourself and it's so important that this be a true experience so if it's conceptual, that's not the true experience. So. so that ox that we got a glimpse of, we can see it, you know, whatever we're doing, whether we're sitting or crying or laughing or eating or drinking or spilling. It's just that. But the ox itself is devoid of content. You realize when you realize there's saltiness in the sea or or binder and pigment, then it's actually an insight that it's an analogy to carrying it over to seeing the nature of who you are. And you can say that this ox is your true self. So the way you've been looking at things changes completely. So there's a verse about this that says, suddenly the voice clear, that, excuse me, suddenly the clear voice of the bush warbler trills in the treetops. A warm sun shines, there is a gentle breeze, the willow by the river are green. There is no longer a place for the ox to hide. The head with the soaring horns is magnificent. It would defy any artist. So suddenly the clear voice of the bush warbler trills in the treetops. 
So when the sound of the birds penetrate your heart, it's clear and sudden. So treating this as a koan, don't come to Dokusan and say the birds and I are one. <laughs> or don't act as if you're a bird. If there's the slightest gap, you have missed it, and the ox has escaped. Abstractions, concepts, and thoughts are toys of Zen and are not real Zen. So finding the ox must be as clear as the sound of the metal art. So the next line says, a warm sun shines, there's a gentle breeze, the willow by the river are green. So the spring landscape is the landscape of the heart, in which there are no dark clouds, since the whole sky disappears. So at this point, the student becomes one with their koan, and there's no longer a self, which is working on the koan. And yet there is a self. So what is that self? You know, we chant, uh, when you see that the self is no self, that no self is the self then you can put down your heavy pack and enjoy the spring breeze. So the next line says, there's no longer a place for the ox to hide. So there's no longer a place for the ox to flee from a person and there's no place for the person to flee from the ox. So wherever you look, that's the ox. It's the mountains, the rivers, the trees, the grasses, the gravel, the stones, the cars, the buildings. And the head with the soaring horns is magnificent. It would defy any artist. So there's no artist on earth who could capture the true essence of the ox heart. As soon as one line appears on the canvas, the ox is compromised. So not that it can't, you know, inspire us or encourage us. It's just that it's the finger pointing at the moon. It's not the moon. So no matter how we describe the moon, it's not the moon. But you know, we chant an identity of relative and absolute. Hearing words, you should grasp the great reality. So seeing images, you can grasp the great reality too. But just don't confuse the two. So at this point, the herdsman tries to hold on to the vision of the ox and parade it down the street. <laughs> you know, it's like putting a post-it on your forehead and saying, look what I found. So as soon as you think and act as if you saw it, then you're stuck. That's why it's the third stage. It's the inexpressible landscape of the heart. Now, <clears throat> Trungpa wrote, you're startled at perceiving the ball. And then, because there is no longer any mystery, you wonder if it was really there and you perceive its insubstantial quality. And then you begin to accept this perception of non-duality. You relax. 
You no longer have to defend the existence of your ego. You can afford to be open and generous. So you find another way. You begin to find that there's another way to deal with your projections. And that is joy in itself. It's the first spiritual level of the attainment of a bodhisattva. So don't doubt that this ox exists. Even though you might wonder about it. And it's all a product of our practice. So. So that's about all that I want to say right now. Let's see if any of you have any comments or questions you want to bring up. <clears throat>